range of topics today. Um, and so I'll be discussing, first of all, the impact of COVID-19 on pediatric mental health, particularly on depression. Um, and then I will uh, do a brief introduction over um, routine screening for depression, diagnosis, assessing severity level, as well as then developing a patient-centered treatment plan in the primary care setting. Um, and finally, I'll touch on suicide screening, as well as um, assessing severity of risk um, in youth with suicidal thoughts or actions, and then determining the appropriate next step, again, within the primary care setting. Um, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions along the way. Happy to talk um, more specifically after I do my general overview. All right, I have nothing to disclose. Um, so first off, um, a very brief introduction to primary care in the depression in and depression. Um, you know, in primary care, we talk about just sort of the normal um, growth and trajectory of every child we see there. And depression itself is really a major disruption in that normal trajectory that we are seeing. Um, it's a interfering with development, and it can really range from um, something very mild and transient to a very severe depression um, that can include suicidal ideas, plants, intent, and ultimately can be quite lethal. Um, and often we see depression not as a or you know purely organic um, brain mechanism, but it can often occur in response to the environmental stressors that a child or youth is facing. And that can particularly, um, you know, be relevant in times right now in terms of thinking about COVID and all the stressors that COVID is um, putting onto our youth. Um, a little bit about the epidemiology of depression. Um, so the average age of onset in teenagers with depression is about 15 years. And by age 18, data shows that about one in five teenagers have had an episode of either major depression or some other type of depression. Um, in terms of um, male-female ratio in children, it's pretty much 50-50 uh, males to uh, females in terms of those who experience depression. But in the teenage years, um, there is more of a female predominance in those who are manifesting depression. And there, as we know, there's a genetic link. And so very often, anywhere from 20 to 50% of the time, um, a teenager who is diagnosed with depression will likely have a parent also with a diagnosis of depression. So, um, you know, what's going on now with COVID? So right now we know that COVID is majorly impacting the lives of everyone, and that includes children and adolescents, and essentially day-to-day uh, -day life for children and youth have, has been turned completely upside down. Um, they're, they're experiencing a major disruption in routines, and we know that routines um, and sort of the, the, the fabric of the community is ordinarily, um, you know, something that really fosters resilience in, in children who are experiencing adverse life events. And so not having those routines to rely on is really significantly, um, you know, a negative factor in their lives. Um, you know, they're not attending school, there's no sports, activities, camps, and um, there have been some reports that rates of child abuse will rise during times of school closures, such as the summertime, so that can be extrapolated to COVID as well. Um, you know, COVID right now is really impacting adults. There's a lot of high stress. There's a lot, large amounts of information out there. Adults are stressed out. They're very anxious, and children are picking up on that. It can really impact the parent-child relationship. Um, parents may not know how to talk about COVID or the difficult feelings and events that they're facing um, right now in terms of both COVID and um, racially motivated violence. And so parents may be avoiding talking about these feelings and kids are kind of left wondering what's going on because they're picking up on, on sort of the parental distress. And finally, um, you know, this time is a time of new trauma experiences as well for kids. Um, for example, they may have lo lost somebody to COVID. Um, they may have lost significant connections in their lives through the disruption of their routines. And there's a general sense of a loss of safety and security in the community uh, with sort of this prevailing illness that, you know, kind of lurks around every corner. And that's very distressing for many of our young people. Um, you know, in the research about depression and suicide, there's a lot of information about how 
stressors can impact um, depression, how it can really exacerbate a depressive episode, and how certain stressors can also um, increase one's risk for suicide attempts and completed suicide. And so in the research, um, you know, it's been shown that economic stress, social isolation, uh, decreased access to community and religion, as well as barriers to mental health treatment and physical illness. These are just some of the examples of um, stressors that can, you know, make depression worse or precipitate a depressive episode. And that really goes hand in hand with how COVID is affecting people's lives these days. Um, you know, certainly many families are experiencing a tremendous amount of increased economic stress uh, with loss of jobs and um, and the economic downturn that we've experienced um, as well. Teenagers may be experiencing sort of uncertain career pot prospects or kind of an uncertain future. There is certainly a lot of social isolation going on right now with the mandated social distancing and the regular routine shutdown. Um, along with social distancing, a lot of religious services are not able to um, you know, continue with their routine programming, resulting in increased um, isolation away from the religious community that many people rely on. And um, generally now there's you know, often a fear of going to the hospital or seeking medical care because of the fear of um, increased risk for catching COVID in medical settings. And that might also be um, you know, creating an increased barrier to mental health treatment, as well as many clinics being closed or operating at lower capacity. And finally, if one does fall ill from COVID, there's certainly a lot of anxiety and despair along with symptoms and a feeling of uncertainty about what might happen. So these factors really, um, you know, typically would increase one's risk for depression. And in the current times, they are certainly all um, very likely to happen and therefore sort of um, increasing everyone's risk for mental health problems. Um, one note about this, these uh, stressors at the bottom, firearm sales, domestic violence, and media, these are all um, risk factors for increased risk for suicide attempts and completed suicide. Um, and that's, these are also things that have increased recently. Um, there's been reports of increased sales of firearms in the U.S. as COVID has taken a hold of our nation. Um, there's also been reports of increased alcohol use, alcohol purchase, and domestic violence during the lockdown, lockdown as well as um, increased reports of suicides. For example, um, the media reporting on the suicide of a physician at Columbia Presbyterian um, in the last uh, couple of weeks and um, irresponsible me media reporting can really um, impact uh, suicide rates in those who are exposed to the, to the reporting. So with all of the stressors that I've just talked about, you know, what are you guys already seeing in your primary care practices? This is probably not a surprise, but um, you know we kind of expect that many kids and teens are presenting with increased worry and stress. And even if they're not able to say exactly that they're worried or stressed or sad, they may be manifesting it through acting out or shutting down and not talking about their feelings or having uh, sleep problems. Um, they might be manifesting new mental health disorders during this stressful time, such as depression, anxiety, PTSD, disruptive behavior, or substance use. Um, though with those who already have a mental health um, condition, they may experience a worsening of their symptoms. And all of this, kind of all the stress and all of this increased symptomatology may result in increased suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And so as frontline providers to um, the community and to children and youth um, here, you know, it's very important to be on the lookout for any psychiatric symptoms that are um, particularly exacerbated by the current times. Um, one thing that I will continue to highlight today in today's talk is really how do we distinguish between, you know, something that's clinical depression and um, a very normal reaction to, you know, all of the things that are going on in our, uh, in our nation, in our world right now. Um, with all of the stressors that I've talked about and with all the changes in, in young people's lives, 
it is very, very reasonable to expect that they might come in with some new complaints such as physical somatic complaints, or they might be feeling a little more socially withdrawn. Um, academics can, might be declining, especially in you know, sort of this changing time of going to school um, online and having to adjust to such a different structure as uh, substance use um, or self-criticism. Any or all of these might be you know, sort of almost normal uh, reactions to what's going on. And so the main thing to look out for, um, especially when counseling parents, is that you know, one change might be reasonable and um, you know, is not un re uncommon for an adolescent to have one of these during you know, their adolescence. But if there's a significant change in which there's multiple changes and it, um, the changes occur very rapidly and there's a significant change in the teenager's functioning, then um, that's when you are thinking more that it's a clinical depression versus, um, you know, kind of a, a natural reaction to, to COVID. And we'll continue to revisit this when we talk about um, the process for addressing depression in the primary care setting. So I just wanted to uh, bring, quickly show this slide to show that there are, um, as you probably heard of, the GLAD PC um, toolkit, which is basically guidelines for PCPs in terms of uh, delineating how to manage um, depression in the primary care setting. And so I'm going to talk about all of these steps. Um, and uh, finally, we'll talk about suicide screening at the end. So the first step um, in terms of the approach to depression is uh, obviously screening. Um, and I know many, if not all of you, are doing the um, PHQ-9 screening with teenagers in your practices already. So that's great. Um, and uh, basically, you know, over 11 is a positive screen and PHQ-9 can really help you to um, delineate sort of the severity of the symptoms as well based on the number score that they're getting. Um, this is a screening tool that's validated for teenagers and there's less evidence of its use in kids, although, um, you know, for depending on the child, it may still be a useful tool. Once you've got the screening done, um, then we're thinking more about, you know, the evaluation part and asking the child about their experience. And so how might uh, depression present clinically to you? So there's a lot of different ways. It's a very, um, you know, kind of heterogeneous uh, clinical manifestation. Obviously, there, there can be sadness or changes in mood, such as irritability and anger. Loss of pleasure or interest in activities is a major um, hallmark of depression, especially for the younger population. There might be somatic complaints. As I mentioned before, there might be behavioral problems, acting out, sleep, appetite disturbance, and a decline in school functioning. Um, Social isolation and anxiety, I've starred here because again, this is sort of tricky to delineate whether you know, a child is more socially isolated because of the imposed shelter in place and you know, mandated social distancing, or if this is really a manifestation of um, a potentially a depressive disorder. And again, anxiety is something that is, you know, we are really expecting to see during um, the time right now. And so again, a little bit tricky to determine if it's really related to depression. Um, you might also see poor self-care and increased risky behaviors. And the main thing to remember from all of these different um, clinical presentations is that you're, what you're really looking for is the functional impairment that these um, symptoms are causing. You're looking for um, you know, a teenager who, whose function is, functioning is severely impaired, whether that's at school or interpersonally or with their family. Um, you're looking for severe, kind of the severity of the symptoms and a more severe um, symptoms are more concerning for depressive disorder. And then finally, you're thinking about the distress that the symptoms are causing. So if you're looking at something where there's a little bit of mild sadness, mild um, sleep appetite disturbance, there's not a lot of distress and the, and the patient is still functioning, um, just as they were before, then this may be more of, you know, sort of a transient reaction to COVID um, that you would keep an eye out on for instead of, you know, a major depressive episode that you're immediately jumping onto action, into action for. So that's kind of the hallmark. 
So once you've done your screening and um, you're ready to kind of talk to the teenager and to the parents about, you know, the, your concerns from a positive PHQ-9, um, here's a couple of pearls. This may be, you know, definitely harder to do via video um, telehealth in terms of interviewing the patient and parent separately, but especially for teenagers, this is really important because with the teenager themselves, you'll have a chance to discuss confidentiality and to elicit a lot of symptoms that they may not volunteer spontaneously, and especially they may not volunteer if their parent um, or guardian is around. Um, you know, sometimes with a, a teenager who isn't um, readily sharing symptoms or or their concerns, it's very um, helpful to use normalizing statements like, um, you know, in this time, a lot of teenagers are experiencing worries or they're experiencing sadness that they're not able to go to school and see their friends. Is that something that is happening for you? And just really kind of highlighting that, you know, they're not alone and that um, it's a very understandable and common um, feeling that they may be feeling. And finally, if it's relevant and possible, it is also helpful to get history from not only the teenager, but also um, other people in the teen's life, such as teachers, parents, coaches, counselors, therapists, if they're seeing a therapist, um, in order to get a more um, comprehensive picture of what's going on. So there's a couple of reasons and goals for the evaluation of a teenager with depression. Um, and so I'll talk about each of these goals, but essentially after you're finished with the screening, the first thing you want to do is confirm whether there is a diagnosis of depression. And once you've confirmed that, you want to clarify um, the severity of the symptoms because the severity of the depression will then guide you in terms of your next steps and treatment, um, whether that's you know watchful waiting, active monitoring, or starting an SSRI, or referring to a therapist, or referring to a psychiatrist. Um, it'll be really helpful to also develop an understanding of what the exacerbating and mitigating influences are. Um, you know, what are the what are the factors that are really impacting the teenager's depression in their life? And then determining the current level of functioning compared to the baseline, whether that's at home, at school, or um, in relationships. And that can help to guide treatment goals in terms of um, you know, returning to their prior uh, level of functioning um, versus where they are right now. Um, you know, through a, during a comprehensive evaluation, you'd be thinking about comorbidities, which I'll talk about, including rule out of, um, you know, medical conditions that may be impacting a teen's mood. And then finally, at the end of this talk, I'll talk about um, suicidal thoughts and behavior briefly. So first of all, we're gonna confirm the diagnosis of depression. Um, so remember that mnemonic from medical school, SIGI CAPS. Um, the DSM-5 diagnosis of depression requires a depressed or irritable mood um, for at least two weeks plus five of the following from SIGI CAPS. Um, and so this is going to be elicited during your interview with an adolescent and confirming that they are experiencing five of the following here. Next, we're gonna clarify the severity of the symptoms. So a useful tool in helping to um, start to understand the severity is already you have the PHQ-9 score. And so, um, you know, over 20 is considered moderate. Um, and then 15 to 19 is consider considered um, moderately severe. So you already kind of have a guideline for how severe the symptoms may be with a patient. Um, you can also think about it as, you know, how many of the SIGI CAPS uh, criteria do they have? Do they have most of the, the SIGI CAPS or do they have a couple? And then what is their level of impairment in functioning? Um, you know, are they staying home in bed all day, not getting to school or going on to their school classes, not socializing, not eating, losing weight, not sleeping? Or is it a much more mild picture? Um, the third part of the evaluation was understanding exacerbating and mitigating influences. And I wanted to briefly talk about um, kind of this biopsychosocial construct that sometimes we in mental health um, utilize to kind of understand all of the different factors that might be contributing to a patient's depression. 
Um, as I mentioned before, we don't think of depression as a purely biological or purely social um, condition. We really think about it as you know, a confluence of these three different factors that ultimately um, puts one um, at risk and precipitates um, a, dis a depressive episode. And so under having a, an understanding in terms of, you know, is there a family history of depression? Um, you know, what are the teens coping styles? Um, you know, are there other uh, comorbid um, psychological things going on such as anxiety or a learning disorder? And what's going on in their environment is really um, helpful in terms of understanding you know, what's contributing to depression and then using that information to talk to the family about, you know, your understanding of the teenager's depression and what you're recommending in terms of next steps. And then uh, the next step is to determine the current level of functioning. So, um, you know, this is an area where in particular it might be helpful to elicit the information from parents rather than from the teen himself or herself. Um, and if possible, talking to other others in their life, like teachers, therapists, counselors, coaches, to really understand, um, you know, what their baseline is and what, um, you know, concerned loved ones are seeing now. And then, of course, you want to rule out any medical comorbidities, particularly um, anything that might be inducing a mood disorder through medications or um, an organic etiology to depression, such as, you know, hypo hypothyroidism. Um, infections, anemia, or the use of any medications that might be um, precipitating low moods, such as antiepileptics, steroids, or antivirals. Um, and then, you know, there's going to be kind of a question of is this depression or is this grief because something has, um, you know, the teen has lost a loved one recently, in which case, you know, if the um, episode lasts for longer than six months and there's suicidal thoughts, then, then that's depression. Um, dysthymia is when there's low mood for over two years. So, you know, a teen may have had dysthymia and are only, they might just be talking about it now with you, in which case um, it's still a valid diagnosis. And again, in terms of distinguishing depression from, you know, a response to COVID, that's, um, sort of a transient and normal reaction, we want to be thinking about the impairment in functioning and the level of distress for the, for the child. And then lastly, to complete your evaluation, um, you're thinking about safety and you're going to be asking about suicidal thoughts and behaviors, and I'll go over that in the last section. All right, so once you've finished your screening, you've done a wonderful evaluation um, with the teenager and with the parent and understanding that this is a diagnosis of depression, what do you do from there? Um, so I think about it this in four steps. You're going to provide education to the family about um, that this diagnosis of depression that you're making. You're going to think about what referrals are appropriate, whether that's therapy or to a psychiatrist if um, that's you know, the appropriate step. Um, then, you know, if you're not referring to a psychiatrist, or even if you are and you're waiting for that bridge to, ther to, to get them connected, you might be talking about treatment, starting treatment with, um, within the primary care setting, and then finally maintenance. So education um, is a really important part, and it's the, really the first step after you make the diagnosis of depression. And, um, you know, sometimes it's not easy to have the conversation depending on the stage of the family and, you know, how they think about mental illness and mental health. Um, and so some tips, you know, for having the conversation and having it go smoothly is under one, assessing sort of the stage that the family is at in terms of how they're thinking about what's going on for the teenager. Normalizing, you know, depression, normalizing sadness, normalizing whatever it is that they're, the patient's going through. Sometimes um, I found it useful to, you know, bring the conversation back to the brain if uh, you're working with a family who might be a little more reluctant or might not be, um, you know, ready to um, think about a depression diagnosis. Sometimes, um, you know, parents might think this, they're just doing this on purpose. Why don't they snap out of it? Um, you know, they can, they can 
do X, Y, Z differently. And in those cases, talking about how depression, um, you know, kind of comes from a, a sort of a neurobiological basis can be helpful in terms of uh, shifting sort of the blame off of the teenager and saying that it's, you know, not within their control um, and, and talking about sort of neurotransmitters and how medications address that. And just kind of um, recognizing that there is a lot of stigma even in 2020 um, about mental health and treatment and, and um, the difficulty there. When you're talking to the family about, um, you know, your diagnosis of depression, things to talk about, um, number one, the cause of depression. So, you know, all of the different factors that you're understanding are impacting the, the teenager um, and kind of the, the different exacerbating and mitigating influences. The symptoms of depression, relating it to what they've told you already. Natural history and expectations. So talking about depression as an episodic disorder where, um, you know, episodes of depression are expected to remit on their own um, anywhere from six to 12 months generally, but treatment makes remission, you know, um, come about much quicker. And then talking about the risks and safety planning um, surrounding depression and suicidal thoughts. And then finally talking about, you know, are, is there further assessment needed, um, you know, more diagnostic clarification from a mental health professional, or are, can we go talk about treatment options right off the bat, and then how to monitor, um, you know, once treatment is underway. So note about um, thinking about referrals. So again, we're going back to the pyramid of the level of severity of the depression. Um, and so when it becomes a moderate to severe depression, um, that's when we think about referrals. In moderate depression, we think about a referral to a therapist. In a severe depression, you could think about a referral to um, behavioral health, psychiatry. And um, often uh, the, the idea in terms of PCP um, primary care management of depression is not to manage every single case of depression, but really to be able to target those mild to moderate cases that are either being actively monitored or being treated um, with you know, the first SSRI, first line medication. So if you have a patient um, who is presenting with a pretty mild depression, um, we recommend what is called active monitoring, which is checking in with the patient uh, weekly or biweekly for about six to eight weeks. And during that time, um, you'd want to talk about, you know, treatment goals. So what, um, you know, symptoms or uh, declining functioning are you hoping to ameliorate? really practicing a lot of um, self-care and wellness, such as encouraging exercise, sleep, um, you know, less social media, et cetera. Collaborating with anybody who might be already involved in the patient's care, such as therapists or counselors at school. And of course, um, talking about safety and having a safety plan. And after six to eight weeks, um, if there is no improvement in um, functioning and symptoms, or if things get worse, then you would move to the next step, which is therapy and an SSRI. If, however, uh, the teenager presents to you and they are um, already experiencing a moderate to severe depression, then you would not you know, do the active monitoring for six to eight weeks. You jump right into potentially treating the depression. And that would include a combination potentially of psychotherapy and or um, a, a medication and SSRI. And of course, as I mentioned before, you'd all still have the safety planning in place. Um, and once you go through the steps of, you know, trying an SSRI and therapy, and if things do get still get worse, then again, you would consider a referral to behavioral health. Just wanted to say a quick note about therapy. So there's two types of um, therapies that are evidence-based for depression in um, children and teenagers, and the most common one being CBT that's often done. Um, IPT is also evidence-based, um, but it's a little less popular, um, and it's kind of more based around problem solving and the on, with the foundation that interpersonal problems are um, at the basis of an adolescent's depression. With CBT, uh, the framework is that you know, thoughts influence our mood and feelings, and thoughts also influence our behavior. 
which also influences our mood and feelings. And so in order to target our mood, what we do is we target the thoughts and we target the behaviors. And when we do that, the mood subsequently changes. Um, so you may have, you know, talked to the adolescent about their depression, then you've told them that you want to make a referral to a therapist. And then the next step um, is talking to them about potentially considering medication for those moderate um, to severe cases that you're managing. Um, so there's a couple of SSRIs that are um, FDA approved in the pediatric age range. Lexapro, escitalopram, and fluoxetine are um, approved for MDD. Um, fluoxetine is approved for ages eight and up, and Lexapro is approved for ages um, 12 and up. And so these are the, probably the two medications that you're considering. And really a lot of um, practice guidelines you know, urge you to just start with Prozac as there's the most amount of evidence uh, for Prozac use in, in kids and teenagers. Um, you know, there's also evidence for these other medications, including sertraline, but again, FDA approval is only for sertraline's use in OCD. So let's say you're starting with fluoxetine. Um, so you would probably start, depending on how um, young or old the patient is, with anywhere from 2.5 to 10 milligrams. So if you've got a really um, older adolescent, um, you know, 200 pounds, and you're thinking, maybe I'll start with fluoxetine, 10 milligrams. If you've got a young child, you'd be starting with 2.5. And anyone who um, also might seem like they um, have a history of anxiety, you would might want to start lower as well as um, kids with anxiety tend to experience more of the side effects associated with these medications. Um, and then you've got a target dose of our, around 20 milligrams and a maximum dose of 60. And so um, you're going to be increasing by about uh, five milligrams, five to 10 milligrams every two weeks until you hit the um, target dose and then further increase it um, until you see clinical benefit until you get to the maximum dose. And, um, you know, there's, there is an SSRI withdrawal syndrome with many SSRIs. So if you are wanting to stop a medication, it'll be important to tell the patient to talk to you about it and then you can taper them off um, you know, kind of reducing the dose every week or so um, until they're off of it. Prozac does have a longer half-life, the fluoxetine, so it's less critical to taper off fluoxetine, but if you um, are wanting to stop, it can still be, you know, very uh, prudent to still taper it. And then before you're starting an SSRI, um, it's always important to talk to the families about the side effects really talking about the black box warning as you don't want to surprise the family or the parent um, by having them pick the medication up at the pharmacy and finding uh, this black box warning. And then discuss, discussing um, how you're gonna be monitoring, monitoring the, um, the medication as well as its impact on uh, the child's depression. So I think of um, side effects with SSRIs in kind of two boxes. The first box I think of as sort of pretty common side effects that happen when um, a child starts the medication or changes the dose. So whether, when they start the medication or when they increase the dose, they might experience GI side effects like nausea, vomiting, stomach ache. Um, they might have some dizziness or headaches. All of that is pretty common and it will um, subside by itself. So, um, you know, sometimes I say, you know, let me know, but you know, um, a lot of these side effects will kind of go away once your body gets used to it. So you probably just continue uh, with the treatment and monitor the side effects and expect that these effects would go away. Um, what's more concerning are, um, you know, the sort of activation mania or suicidal ideation black box warning effects that are rare, but also, you know, could potentially occur with uh, taking an SSRI. And so you'd want to talk to them about if they're feeling um, like they're getting really anxious and um, they're having racing thoughts, they're talking fast, they're not sleeping. Those are signs of mania and that to, um, to stop the medication, let you know right away or uh, call 911 and go to the ER. And the same with suicidal ideation. Um, if your patient is experiencing sort of um, some side effects and, um, you know, it's not they're finding that it's not 
you know, incredibly mild and that there is some discomfort, you could also consider uh, reducing the dose or changing the scheduling of the medications to help um, mitigate those side effects. So for example, if they're feeling really sleepy when they're taking the medication, changing it to nighttime dosing. Or um, as is common, you know, if you have an adolescent who's experiencing sexual side effects, then you might want to go down to the last dose where um, this was not such a problem for them instead of stopping altogether. And then just a note about the black box warning. So um, the black box warning says that there is an increased risk of suicidality, and that includes suicidal thinking and behavior in children and adolescents up to the age of 24 being treated by SSRIs. It's really based on um, trials with about 4,000 children and teens over um, nine different SSRI medications. And they found that um, 4% on SSRIs spontaneously reported suicidal thinking or behavior versus only 2% on placebo. Um, there's a lot of criticism about uh, sort of the black box warning and whether you know it's really, it should be there. First of all, um, it's bizarre that they only relied on sp spontaneous report of suicidal thinking and behavior as um, you know, in clinical practice, you'd never want to just wait and see if your patient spontaneously reports SI. You'd always want to make sure that you're checking and asking them about it. So it's a really um, bizarre approach. And you know, the one main thing is that there's no, there was no completed suicide out of the 4,400 children and teens who um, took these SSRIs. So um, unclear, sort of certainly scary that there might have been an increased incidence of, um, of suicidal thinking. Um, but that ultimately it was not lethal. Subsequent to this, these studies and after the FDA approval or FDA um, black box warning came out, um, there were other studies that you know, sh showed mixed results um, that you know, there actually was no treatment effect on suicidal thinking. There was a lot of evidence that actually depression with fluoxetine significantly improved. Um, that, that much was clear. Um, and so right now, you know, generally our approach is to make sure that the family is aware that there could be an increased risk of the suicidal thinking and behavior, um, but that generally the evidence is overwhelming that not treating depression is much more um, dangerous than um, the effect of the SSRI and to counsel them to, you know, monitor their child closely um, for any worsening um, depression, suicidality, or changes in behavior. Um, and to sort of um, provide that kind of approach. And then in terms of monitoring, once you started the SSRI, in the first month, um, you're, it's recommended that you monitor the patient weekly. This doesn't have to be in person. This can be a phone call or a check-in of some sort. Um, and you're wanting to increase the medication about every two weeks if there's no side effects. And then the second month, you can go to bi-weekly monitoring. You'd expect to see benefits within a couple of weeks. Um, sometimes patients see benefits sooner, so I always tell them, I don't tell them like definitely you're not going to see any side of any benefit until three to five weeks. I always say, always say, you know, it's possible that you might experience some benefit in a few days. Sometimes it takes um, patients three to a couple of weeks, three to five weeks. Um, so it's kind of hard to it's hard to predict, but to not sort of erase the hope that they'll start feeling better within the week. Um, and then finally, you know, if there's been no improvement after six to eight weeks, or there's a really intolerable side effect, then um, you would consider switching to an, another SSRI. Um, and at that point, you would consider um, referring to behavioral health as well. And, um, you know, we've talked about SSRIs, we've talked about psychotherapy, really the evidence out there says that the combination of um, SSRIs and psychotherapy is more effective than either um, on its own. And so to be thinking about that and counseling your patients on um, the efficacy of having both simultaneously, not just taking a, a, you know, Prozac and hoping things get better. And then there's a, many situations in which you might not want to start an SSRI. You might want to just directly refer them to psychiatry. Um, and that might mean that might be in situations where it's very complex. There's psychosis. The patient has already been hospitalized. There's a lot of psychiatric comorbidities. Um, there's significant safety concerns, or they're not having a response to um, medication trials that you would uh, refer to psychiatry. And of course, a plug for our um, CAP Portal program. 
um, if at any point during you know your screening evaluation diagnosis treatment planning um, that you have any questions about um, how to help your patient or manage their depression that we're always available Monday to Friday um, to answer the, those questions that you have and we're happy to help and then lastly just a word about uh, suicide assessment in primary care so this is going back to our goals for evaluation at the end I said we want to always assess for safety, suicidal thoughts, and behavior, um, and that you know it's important to do this not only during your initial evaluation for depression, but also on subsequent contact with the patient as well. And unlike that study uh, for uh, you know the black box warning, you don't want to wait for your patient to spontaneously report it. Um, so a quick note about you know suicide assessment in primary care. Um, what we know is that you know, adolescents often see PCPs um, before they attempt suicide and before those who complete suicide um, do so, they've seen a PCP within four months of doing so. Um, and so I guess this is just to highlight sort of the important role that PCPs can really play in talking about suicide with their patients. Um, contrary to some, um, you know, popular belief, talking to patients about suicide does not promote ideas of suicide or increase their risk to um, harm themselves. So, you know, there is no reason not to ask. Um, and in fact, 80% uh, of teens surveyed report that they want others to know about their suffering and to stop them from harming themselves. Um, you know, I, I want to say that, you know, there's really no way to, there's no such thing really as 100% suicide prevention. Um, but what we can do is mitigate and reduce the risk as much as we can. So it's not about, you know, having the onus of prevention is not on you, but rather risk reduction um, as much as we can. And so the approach to do that is to screen and then to ask and clarify, um, you know, what the teenagers mean after the screening, then to determine their level of risk and then to determine the next steps. Screening, um, you may have heard of the ASQ or have already started to use this in your practices. It's a very simple for questions. And if they answer yes to any of those questions, it's a positive screen, in which case they go to number five, having thoughts of killing yourself right now. And if that's a yes, um, then that kind of requir requires urgent behavioral health evaluation. So uh, this is kind of a 911, go to the emergency room, don't be unsupervised sort of situation. Um, to some tips about talking about suicide. Um, obviously a positive connection, therapeutic um, relationship between you and the teenager is really helpful. Um, it's important to talk to the teenager alone and to discuss confidentiality as I mentioned before, as there might be a lot of hesitation about disclosing um, these thoughts in front of um, caregivers or loved ones. Validation as you're talking about it, um, you know, talking about how um, how difficult things are for the teen, um, how much stress it's been, um, how, how much pain they're in, all, sort of using validating language to talk about um, what they're experiencing in their suicidal ideation. And you no, know, just to kind of avoid trying to get into a problem solving or fix it type of mode. So, um, you know, it's sort of the opposite of validation where um, you don't want to be um, you know, hearing about the teen's problems and then suggesting solutions for them, even though the solutions might be clear to you or I, um, we really want to just be validating what, they're, what it is they're going through and then um, making sure that they're safe. So in, a, in the next slide, I'm going to show you um, what's called the CSSRS primary care. It's basically these questions um, that it's just a series of um, eight questions that are very easy to do and they basically cover all of the questions that you might want to ask um, after doing screening to understand you know what the patient is experiencing in terms of suicidal thinking and how high risk they are so the questions include have you wished you were dead have you had thoughts of killing yourself so those questions when you ask those questions um, if they're a yes then that's kind of a low risk um, even though you know there is some risk and then if they say yes to, have you, thinking, have you been thinking about how you might do this? That means that they've been thinking about a plan or have you ever done anything or started to do anything to end your life? They've actually taken steps in the past. Again, that puts them in medium risk. And then if they answer affirmative to 
these questions, such as having intent to act on the thoughts or worked out details on how they want to um, end their life, or they have intent to carry out the plan, or they've started to take um, action in the past three months, these, um, you know, affirmative to these questions puts the teenager at high risk. And um, in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about what you might want to do if it's high risk versus low risk. I always also ask about firearms in the home because um, it's a major risk factor for completed suicide. And if there are firearms in the home, it's really important to um, you know, speak with the parents about um, removing that from the home. So this is, um, this is available from the Columbia CSSRS website. It's the triage for primary care. These questions are the questions that I highlighted in the slide before about wishing you were dead and then, you know, kind of all the questions there. And then this is um, basically if they say yes to these questions, this means it's um, low risk. Orange means medium risk. And if they answer yes to any of these red questions, then it's high risk. And um, it's six questions, so pretty straightforward. If you get any in the red, then um, then it's high risk and we'll talk about what to do in a second. And then um, I just wanted to say a quick note about um, self injury cutting. Um, so we think about that, we think about sort of um, self injurious thoughts and behaviors as being either suicidal or non-suicidal. Um, and so in the CSRS, we're really evaluating this category of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Um, however, cutting is often um, you know, quite a scary thing to see. And um, it is under the category of self-injury, but it's not under the category of um, with an intent to die. And often it's used by the teenager as a coping me method, as a type of distraction, a way of communication um, in order to communicate the amount of emotional pain that they're in. Um, and so the way to think about that is that it's not an immediately, um, you know, kind of urgent um, suicidal intent or, um, you know, does not immediately require that you call 911 and send them to the emergency room. However, being cognizant that it does put them at much higher risk to make a suicide attempt, that it um, actually raises their risk by nine times. So after you've asked the questions about, um, you know, sort of clarifying more about, you know, what their um, suicidal thinking and intent and plans are, um, depending on which category it's fallen into, high risk, you direct them immediately to the ER to call 911. If it's medium risk, you'd want them to have an urgent appointment with mental health, whether that's um, if they already have a provider, having them follow up with the provider immediately the next day. Um, or if that's not possible, potentially considering sending them to the emergency room as well. Um, and then with those who are at low risk, um, you know, letting the caregiver know that there is some risk to safety, um, thinking about treatment for depression, if that's also what they're experiencing, making a referral to behavioral health, um, and creating a safety plan. Um, and the safety plan, I just wanted to talk briefly about that. So there's a, there, here is a link to um, a sample safety plan that I've put here. Um, basically, there's a couple of components of the safety plan, um, but um, you know, it's kind of meant to um, help the patient as well as people who are caring for the patient really understand um, how the patient can um, reach out when things do get worse. So it asks the patient to generally recognize warning signs of crisis, then to utilize and name some coping skills, name people that they could be calling um, who can support them, such as friends or family. And then usually you can put um, sort of like clinicians, emergency contact information. There's a suicide prevention line as well as um, more local youth crises lines, such as the Alameda Youth Crisis Line. Um, and then, you know, making the environment safe. So talking to a family about um, firearms, sharps in the home, any medications that need to be locked up, making sure that, um, you know, the home environment is safe. And then just thinking about what is positive in the teenager's life and um, you kind of leveraging that as the focal point for them.
All right. Um, so that is the um, conclusion of what I wanted to say about suicide assessment very briefly. And now we have a couple of minutes and just wanted to open up for comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that really comprehensive overview. And really just want to encourage folks, if you have questions, I know sometimes it can be hard to kind of break the seal on these webinars and, and be the first one to jump in. But um, please feel free to kind of raise your hand. There's a virtual hand raising thing that you can use and or to, um, to type in questions. Just while folks are thinking about their questions, you know, one that I um, see come up with some frequency is distinguishing, you know, um, the like someone presents as being suicidal in your office, and <clears throat> and you as the provider feeling like you're sending them to the hospital, like it's a, you know, a done deal that they're going to be uh, psychiatrically hospitalized based on your assessment, and just really wanted to highlight that this is, you know, a way to evaluate for the need for hospitalization by arranging for transport to a county court where they can be evaluated by a mental health person. And it looks like there's some questions. Um, okay, uh, so first question from Margarita. Perhaps you can comment about screening younger kids and kids with autism for suicide. Thanks. Um, and I wanna open this up to you, Petra, too. Um, I think that's a really, really good question. Really challenging population to um, to be eliciting um, to be eliciting, you know, sort of suicidal ideation, intent, and um, sort of those details from. Um, I'm actually not aware. I don't know about any screening tools used for the ASD population. Do you know if there's anything out there? Now that I'm aware of specifically for ASD, there has been on the Columbia website, the Suicide Screener website, there's been, um, I really love how many different tools they have because they have it for not just um, you know, clinicians, but also teachers and firefighters and all kinds of professionals. And um, there has been kind of a younger child screener on there that can be really helpful. We know that in kids 10 and under that the the rates of suicide and risk factors for suicide are increasing and that one of the bigger risk factors for suicide in younger kids is actually ADHD more so than depression. And, you know, if you think about the kind of poor impulse control that can go along with that and maybe the lack of understanding of what it actually means to follow through, that it's um, a moment of feeling, of feeling overwhelmed and, you know, wanting to have the situation or the difficult feeling and or change. And so doing something that is, you know, um, self-directed violence or, you know, doing something that's impulsive and then not recognizing, you know, the next steps of what would happen. <clears throat> and so it's important to kind of look at, you know, what are the um, environmental factors, what can be modified in those ways and, um, and making sure that parents understand, you know, these potential risks. And then in autism, um, you know, just trying to couch it in developmental understanding um, and looking at like, what are the situational reasons? Um, I've certainly seen, you know, some um, teenagers with autism, for example, present with suicidal ideation around, you know, situations that they felt very troubling. And if you can help to problem solve around those and remove the risk factors, then, um, you know, then uh, you can come to a place of not feeling suicidal anymore. Um, I really want to be, you know, careful in that. And if you're feeling in doubt in any way, the more conservative approach would be, you know, to have an evaluation. Um, but we know that um, for kids in particular with significant sensory sensitivities, that having an evaluation for many hours, you know, in an emergency room or in a, a port um, can be really challenging. And so looking at what other kind of resources we can shore up, um, you know, to help problem solve and, and take away the reasons for feeling suicidal. Thank you, Petra. Um, another question we had was, do you have any good resources for self-directed CBT for teens? Um, app, YouTube, book, 
and I'd opened up to all the participants um, if they've ever found any good apps that their patients have liked. Um, you know, for me, I don't think I've, I typically haven't recommended any apps um, other than, you know, meditation apps that sometimes teenagers like to use. And uh, usually I would recommend Headspace for that. Um, I've heard of things like um, mood fit or mood mission for learning coping skills, but I personally haven't had experience um, with those to recommend it. But if anyone um, has any others, please share as well. Um, and we're almost at time, but um, Miriam had a question. Um, oh, she says, I liked the instant help book for teen series. Great worksheets in each book. Look it up on Amazon. And also the Calm app, which I've also heard great things about too. Thank you. Um, and finally, a question about normalizing and discussing mental health and depression with the entire family over telehealth. Definitely challenging um, in terms of um, especially the telehealth aspect, I think, and just not having, you know, the physical presence and being able to read, um, you know, the parents' reaction as well, um, being, you know, over video. Um, Miriam, I'm wondering, are there, um, like, any specific, uh, is there, a, like, a more of a specific question in terms of, you um, normalizing or discussing mental health that you were thinking about? Well, it's more that, you know, it's, it's, even though I've, I asked the teen to go to the room by themselves, you know, often I, I know that the parents are still around. And so, you know, I, I feel like I need to talk in more generalizations. Um, um, and so I'm just, I get, I get a little stuck because I'm like, I, I know I kind of freeze because I'm like, oh, I know that the, your mom's in the background. <laughs> Um, and so just like, you know, I mean, I, I, I do say some of that, like, you know, it's a challenging time for all of us. You know, I feel stressed and sad sometimes, you know, how do you feel? But, you know, I don't know how to, I guess I get a little stuck knowing that there's other people around often. And personally, I just um, like to try and be as inclusive as possible. And you know, if you know that there's someone kind of in the background, the, like you're doing the very like general kind of we language, appropriate self disclosure, and then just citing these statistics, you know, that um, you know that depression affects like X percent in this age group and then across the lifespan. And um, I found helpful just recently, like talking about I mean, the global collective impact. And these are such extraordinary times that we're living in. And how can we not be affected to just you know, make it as much of a universal experience as possible. And, um, and then trying to use what I might know about, you know, the family kind of culture and, um, and thinking about like, you know, um, locating that in current times and current context and acknowledging maybe, you know, generational differences, perceptions around mental illness or depression. And, you know, to say, we used to think that, you know, depression didn't even happen in kids, but now we know that it does. And, yeah, like that. Um, and we've really evolved in these ways. And we know there are different stressors in 2020 than there were, you know, 20 and 40 and 60 years ago um, to just kind of locate it like that. Thanks. Um, we are at time. So thank you so much, Michelle, for such a wonderful presentation. And thank you everyone for the questions and participation. And um, just to put in a word, we have a webinar next week by Dr. Jean Yoon on, um, on sleep and screen time in kids. And so this also feels like a timely topic. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.